All right. Lael Stone is a speaker, educator, and author. Her passion is supporting parents to understand their children, helping adults process their own childhood trauma, and creating education systems that value emotional awareness. If you were to ask Lael what she does, she would say she speaks for the heart of the child. Whether it is supporting parents to understand their children, helping adults process their own childhood trauma, or creating education systems that value emotional awareness, it all comes back to connection and compassion. This is what Lael does. And she's just written her first book, which is now out. It's called Raising Resilient and Compassionate Children. Lael, g'day. Hi, nice to be here. It was a pleasure to have you on here. So tell me, what happens in the average day of Lael? Uh, it's so varied. I'm one of those people that has like about five or six different projects on the go. I get a bit bored if I just do one thing. So I, mm -hmm. I built a school. So, you know, a little portion of my day is always checking in with my school or sometimes I go to the school for the day. Uh, I still see clients. I'm a counsellor, so occasionally I have clients. Um, I build a lot of online programs for parents, that kind of thing. So I sometimes will do a bit of that. I also have my own podcast. So, you know, at least once or twice a week we're recording stuff. Uh, what else do I do? I work for a great organization called the Resilience Project. So I go and do public talks for them. Um, often there's a bit of writing and I'm also a parent. I've only got one child at home left now. So she's 14. Mm -hmm. My two other kids are adults and grown up, but I think every day looks different and I've just moved down the coast. So I try to walk on the beach if I can most days, but that doesn't seem to happen as much, but I, I like a lot of <laughs> variety and variation. So yeah, diff lots of balls in the air. Beautiful. So just like, give me a general rundown. If, if, if parents are come, to come to you, they're mm -hmm. going, we're having trouble with our, our child. Like mm -hmm. what's their general issue? Is it yeah. controlling the child in a way? Like they, the child won't behave. Is that what people come to you about? I think there's two things that I find parents come to. The first one is usually about my child just keeps having big feelings. So lots of meltdowns, lots of feelings. They often go, is this normal? Why are they doing it? Why won't they stop? So that's usually the number one issue. And the second issue is often about cooperation. So how do I get my kids to get in the car or put their shoes on or take their plate to the dishwasher or, and often that usually involves a bit of a battle of wills and often is a bit about control. So mm. when parents will often say, can I come and bring my five-year-old to see you? I actually don't work with the children. I only work with the parents because for me, and, and my theory really works around our children are always responding to their environment. So when I can work with the parents and help them understand perhaps what the children need or what they're saying through their behaviour and also get parents to tune into their own kind of story and stuff around control or behaviour, that's when we begin to see shifts and changes. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I was going to quote you on, actually, because I watched your TEDx talk. Um, you said, what did you say? You said, they only do what we do do where's that quote i wrote it down and it's lost somewhere but you said like <laughs> they don't they they, they 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 can't know what to do children unless they can't see be it. what they can't see yeah children can't be what they can't that's see. it yeah yeah that's it yes. yeah so yes. so let's talk a, a bit about about that um the big feelings so mm. like a child having big feelings you know and i have a two-year-old at current and so we're starting to see some big feelings coming through a couple of yep. tantrum temper tantrums um what is the best way to approach a child who's maybe throwing what we would call a temper tantrum? Yeah. So I think the thing to remember is that um, children are often responding to their environment or responding to what's going on in their in their world. So I always love to simplify it and come back to this theory, right? The kids are either what we call imbalance or out of balance. So you know when your child's in balance because you can hear them singing in their bedroom, you know, they walk out and they might go up to their sibling and say, do you want to play something? And and you say to them, darling, can you please set the table for dinner? And they're like, sure, mum. And it's those moments where you think you're winning at parenting and it's all awesome, right? Because your kids are doing, you know, they're really kind, they're cooperative and you're like, yeah, they're, they're in balance. Then when we have children out of balance, it's when they kind of walk into the room and elbow their sister in the head or they, you know, you ask them to do something and they're like, why do I have to do everything? And, and you can see that there's something going on for them. And I think the number mm. one thing that I always invite parents to do is to do what I call look behind the behavior because there's always a reason for, for why they're behaving the way they are. Now, it can be as simple as something like, you know, they're really hungry and we need to feed them or perhaps they need some help putting their shoes on and that's why they're frustrated or or perhaps it's just they haven't seen you all day and they need a cuddle and a bit of connection and when you meet that need 
then they're back in balance and they're fine. But the other reason why kids can sometimes be out of balance is because there's an accumulation of stresses and traumas that they're carrying and holding in their bodies. And if you think about, you know, an average little four-year-old going to kindergarten or preschool, you know, during a day, they go there and the first thing, you know, that happens is they have to separate from their parents, which can sometimes be really big. So, you know, they can have a little bit of tension in their body just from saying goodbye to you. And then they're happily building their, you know, their tower or their Legos or whatever they're playing. And then someone comes over and knocks it over and they get really frustrated and they don't know how to express that. And then they have to eat lunch and they don't like what was packed in their lunchbox that day. And then they feel a bit upset about that. And then someone pushes them over when they're outside playing and then you know, they, they start doing something else that they don't really enjoy. And so there's all these accumulated little stresses that happen throughout the day in this little four-year-old body. And then they come home and they come back to us, which is a safe place. And then they want something and perhaps they say, you know, can I have a sandwich? And you make them a sandwich, but you cut it the wrong way, right? You don't cut it the triangles or you cut it like squares instead. Or maybe you give them the wrong colored cup, or maybe you give them the, the type of biscuit they don't like, whatever it is. And that's the thing that just tips them over the edge. Now, what's really important that I hope parents understand is the way children find their way back into balance, the way their nervous system resets is through crying, through raging, through laughing, through shaking. We have this beautiful natural inbuilt healing mechanism within all of us that when we can allow those feelings out, then we find ourselves back into our center. And any parent will tell you, you know, when their child has a big meltdown because you gave them the wrong colored cup, then often they'll get angry, they'll get upset, and then they'll move past that anger into those big tears and then they'll come in close for a cuddle and then they'll go what's for dinner right and it's like nothing has ever happened because their body has just reset itself now I think the thing that is really tricky about this is that we have grown up most of us as adults now grew up in a behaviorism paradigm that said you must be good all the time so when you are angry and you're upset well that's not acceptable that's you being bad or naughty and I think for many of us as adults when we were upset or we made a mistake when we were young we were either punished we were sent to our room or we were yelled at or we were told I'll give you mm. something to cry about and we were taught not to express our feelings in normal, healthy ways. And, you know, my work is so much about helping humans understand we all have feelings. We all get angry. We all get sad. We all get frustrated. Yes. We're all happy. We're all joyous. But there's healthy ways to express them. And our job as adults is to help our children find the healthy ways to express them. So it's not okay for you to go over and hit your sister in the head when you're angry, but it's okay to put on some music and, you know, do angry dancing, or it's okay to go outside and yell at the trees, or it's okay to go and get some pillows and throw them around on the trampoline and move the energy in your body. There are healthy ways that we can do it. And, and, you know, my passion is so much about when we can help children express their feelings in healthy ways, then that allows them to develop empathy for others. It allows them to stay in tune with who they are so that they have got that innate sense of knowing who they are. And they then become mature, incredibly intelligent, emotionally intelligent humans who then don't have to act out in big ways, you know, when we're adults. So that that's kind of theory mm. behind what we're talking about here. Yeah. I, you know, you're, what you're kind of describing to me is something that adults have to figure out too, is like, what we do with all of our emotions that we get, like we also like, it doesn't sound so different from the adult day. Something can drive yeah. you up the wall. That's so small and like little things add up, add up, add up. And then you come back to your loved one and you flip it at them. And they're like, what's going yes. on? And what they don't know is that it's a com accumulation of all the crap that you've been going through the whole day. And kids are yes. having the exact same thing. And for some reason we treat mm -hmm. them differently. For some reason we go, how do yes. you know that's being naughty? Whereas in an adult, you'd go, understandable, you've had a bad day. And so what you're actually yes. kind of doing is emotional intelligence both ways. They should have emotional intelligence. We should have emotional intelligence in knowing they've had, an, a, 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 may have had an off day. They're trying to process mm -hmm. uh, or emotions just like a, yep. a human, uh, sorry, an adult. <laughs> an adult yes. battles to uh, deal with their emotions. That's kind of what you're talking yeah, about. Totally. It's exactly the same. I often say, I think that we expect children to have a higher level of emotional intelligence than what we do. Because if you come back to that little four-year-old mm. at kinder, you know, when he gets really upset because you cut his sandwich the wrong way, I think that we expect as adults that he should 
you know, take a deep breath and go, mom, I'm very disappointed that you cut my sandwich the wrong way. I've had a very hard day today. It's very hard separating from you. And, and then someone knocked over my tower and then I got pushed over in the playground and I've got all these frustrations in my body. And then when you're not doing what I want you to do, it's very hard for me to express that. Like, I think that we seriously think that our kids should be able to do that at four or even at 14. And as you say, most adults can't do that. You know, we explode because our partner packs the dishwasher the wrong way or because they forget to bring milk on the way home or whatever it is, right? And I think that's where we yes. need to kind of step back a bit. And, and that's the whole children can't be what they can't see. We have to model what healthy expression of feelings are. We have to show our children, I'm feeling really sad today. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go call a friend because it helps when I talk to someone or I'm going to go write in my mm. journal or I'm going to do some yoga. Like, what do we show our children around how we deal with our feelings? Do we do we show them by just drinking more wine at night or by being so busy that we don't have to feel? Like what are we modelling to our kids around being healthy humans? Yeah, so let's talk about what, what are the best ways to deal with a child, let's just say who, that four-year-old who's come back from kindy, you've cut their sandwich wrong, they've flipped out. How do yeah. you then talk to them? Yeah. So I usually say the first thing you got to do as an adult is take a deep breath and look behind the behavior. And what we want to do firstly is make sure that our narrative in our head isn't, God, why is he making my life hard? Or why is he so naughty? Or why is he so difficult? We want the narrative to be curious, to go, hmm, something must be going on here because his reaction to this sandwich is pretty over the top, right? Mm, and mm-hmm. and that's where we can usually get a bit of an indication maybe something else is going on, right? Because if your child is in balance and you cut their sandwich, the wrong way, they'll probably go, oh, I didn't want it that way. And then they'll move on pretty quickly. But if they have a big reaction to something, then our first job is to be curious as to, oh, I wonder what else is here. So if we can firstly get our head in the right space to say, "Mm, there's something happening. And then my, you know, what I invite parents to do is to get what I call really spacious and to get calm. So you might get down on the floor with them. You might just say what you see. I can see you're really upset because I cut your sandwich the wrong way tell me about it. And if we can be in that calm anchored space where we go, I know it's more than this. And we just hold space for the storm, right? So, you know, they might throw themselves on the floor and go, this is not fair. And I wanted it differently. And our response is like, I hear you keep going. You're doing a good job. Get it out. It looks hard. And really the Mm. less we say, the better, but what our children need. And I think this is what all humans need when we are angry, when we're upset, What we all deeply crave is another human to be calm and compassionate who looks at us through the lens of, oh, I see you. This is really tricky. And I'm here. And I, and I, and I love and accept you even in your wildness. Because as adults, when we're angry and upset, what do we want? We don't want another adult firing back at us or judging us or telling us we should stop Mm. it and go to our room and come out when we're better behaved. We want an adult to go, woof. Looks like this is big. Hey, I'm here. I've got you. I'm rock solid, right? And that's what our children want as well. Our children want us to Mm -hmm. be able to sit there and say, "I, I can handle all of you right? This is not too big for me. And so if we can sit there and be calm and allow the storm to pass, because usually we see a bit of anger at the front and anger is usually just a mask for the sad and the feelings that sit underneath. And then Mm -hmm. often it will move into the sad and the tears. And then often what children will do is they'll want to come in for some closeness and connection. And then you'll see that that storm has passed. And and the beautiful thing about when we are doing that, we are modeling to our children what empathy looks like. We are modeling to them what this beautiful, calm anchoredness feels like so that as they begin to learn and witness what that feels like in their own bodies, then they are able to do that for others as well. That's how they learn emotional awareness, by watching and by us responding to them in ways that um, that meet their needs. Yeah, what you're saying is... Um is beautiful and I want my wife to listen to it so she can know how to deal with me. Um, <laughs> no, but honestly, because, because wouldn't it be nice if, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we took that same curiosity with anybody instead of yes. going, Oh, you're throwing yourself on the floor like a brat uh, and going, yeah. hold on. What's behind the, the behavior yes. like you're saying and getting yes. down on their level. Like I like that getting down a level, m- making a bit of eye contact maybe and going, Hey, mm-hmm. like something's going on here. It's not, not actually mm. about the sandwich, is it? It's about, yeah. you know, totally. like, like, I like, yeah. And, and 
you know, what you're mm. saying there actually is when we can raise our children with this level of awareness, what happens is they don't grow up then to be adults that have tantrums or that project their stuff everywhere because they learn to understand when I have a feeling this is about me and what is going on for me and where are my needs not being met and what do I need to do? So as we mm. we model this to our children, they learn how to do that for themselves. And, you know, I, I built a school based on all of this stuff. And one of the things, the key parts of what we do at our school is we help these kids understand their own feelings and emotions and then be able to express them safely and ask what they need. So for me, it's a win. If a child walks into our principal office and said, I really need to cry or I feel so frustrated, I need to do something, can you help me? I'm like, oh, my God, that is amazing, right? Because Mm. then that child isn't acting out in their behaviour. They're not projecting it onto someone else. They are learning and imprinting. It's okay for me to feel stuff and I can do ways to, I can do things to support myself and help myself so that I can feel it and let it go and then move on. You know, that's the goal. That is a healthy human when we know how to identify our feelings, see the need or see the need behind it, what we need, what we can do to support it and then let it go and move on. Whereas I think we have a lot of adults walking around on our planet with a lot of repressed feelings, a lot of anger that's sitting in there. And then when they bump up against someone that, you know, triggers that feeling within them, then it all comes pouring out. Mm, yeah. I, what, that's interesting because I relate to so much of what you're saying. And, you know, um, did we grow up in a shame-based culture yes. and where it was like, oh, uh, you're highly emotional, you're a brat. Yes. Or, you know, yes. you need to, oh, you, oh, you seem angry as a four-year-old, yeah. you're too much, you're, you're a brat. You know, you need to be, you should be punished. You should go and sit in the room alone and think about what you've yeah. done, AKA get emotional. It seems very shame-based and we're not, we're moving on from that. That's what I'm hearing. Is that right? Well, I hope we're moving on from that, but you know, our, as long mm. as our culture kind of works with punitive measures, shame will always be present. And so punitive measures are when you're mm-hmm. not doing something that I agree with, I'm going to punish you, right? Or if you do something that I agree with, I'll reward you. And most of our systems are set up in that way and particularly around children. You know, I need you to be good. I need you to sit down and listen to what I'm saying. And if you do, then I'll give you five mm-hmm. minutes extra playtime or you'll get another lollipop or whatever it is. Now, the problem with that is, yes, you might get some short-term results, but what it does is it actually takes the child away from what their innate yeses and no are and their innate uh, knowing of what they need in their body because it all becomes about, do I have this person's approval? And so then what happens is we then develop these cultures that are based all around good boys and good girls. And that's the product of, I think, a lot of, of our generation as adults and parents now. We grow up in this behaviorism paradigm, being good boys and good girls. And really what that means is often then we will become adults and we're often scared to take risks because, well, what happened? Mm. Will people judge me? Does this person like me? Did I say something stupid? Are they thinking I'm an idiot? I'm not okay. Our sense of self is completely connected to what we perceive others to approve of, right? Instead of being connected to ourself, which means I am enough just the way I am, right? I don't, I don't need you to approve of me to know that I'm okay. I don't need to be the most beautiful. I don't need to make the most money. I don't need to have the best body, whatever it is that's connected to our enoughness. And so when we Mm. can actually come back to understanding that when we punish children and when we shut them down with their feelings and emotions, you might get the result you want in the behavior. But what happens is those feelings, they have to go somewhere and they usually go internal. And what they can become is a a really harsh inner talk that says, I'm not good enough. If I was good, my parents would love me. If I was smart enough, the teachers would be kind to me. It becomes a bit of a shame loop about who we are. And then it Mm. also becomes a bit of a pattern of, well, when I feel upset or when something's wrong, I need something to numb. Or I need something to deal with that. And then that then often stems into us growing up with, with doing a lot of unhealthy patterns when things feel hard, which is why we want to drink lots of wine or eat all the ice cream or work so much that we can't stop or be online all the time or whatever it is that numbs us from actually mm. feeling, you know, those patterns are ingrained when we're young because most of us were never given the opportunity to express how we really felt. Yeah. So what's the opposite of a punitive measure? Well, the opposite of punitive measure is connection, right? So Mm. what we look at is I think for a long time we've thought that children will only behave if we come down hard on them, right? And we either take something away or we give something to them. But this, this philosophy really sits around that children actually naturally want to connect and want to do the right thing and want to please us. Like a child's natural state is to be in balance and to feel good. 
but sometimes mm. stuff gets in the way, right? So sometimes stresses get in the way and that kind of throws their nervous system and it's very hard for them to cooperate or do the right thing because they're so full up with feelings. Or sometimes they have no choice in autonomy in their life and they feel really powerless and they're going to try and find their power back in other ways because they're not you know, given choice around what they need to do. We all love choice and autonomy as humans. So we kind of look at it this way is that, and this is kind of a lot, one of the philosophies we work with with our school is that children, we see them as beautiful and, and imbalanced as a, as a baseline, right? That, that a child is, we want to be naturally connected. And if they are pushing back on something, if they're having a hard time, if they're kind of behaving in a way that's not great, then our first step is mm, there's something going on here and where can we be connected with them to help them come back into balance? So the more connected we can be as parents or as educators, the more a child feels seen and the more they feel seen, the more they want to do the right thing, the more they want to. It feels better to be connected. Like no child feels good hitting another child. No child feels good mm. throwing a chair across the classroom. They're not doing it because they want to. They're doing it because they're like, I can't cope anymore or I feel really powerless or things feel too much. And so yeah. as adults, we need to constantly look behind the behavior and be curious that if our child is acting out, we're like, hmm, what's going on? Now, in the sake of your son, who's two, right? Beautiful two-year-olds are just the best, right? They're so gorgeous and curious. But your little one's going to be moving into that phase where he's going to be like, oh, I want to do it my way. <laughs> and This feels hard. And, and we get all those beautiful natural pushbacks and progressions just because he's a toddler, right? And, and that's very normal. Mm -hmm. It's, sometimes it's not about him necessarily being out of balance. Sometimes it's just being too, right? But the way yes. we always meet that is through connection and compassion and understanding and guiding our children. And it doesn't mean that we don't have boundaries and limits because it's really important that children have limits as well. But the way we set the limits is important. You know, when we're yelling at a child to do something, then we're the one that's usually out of balance. Whereas if we can set a limit calmly, I'm not willing for you to do that. That's a no right now, but you can tell me how you feel about it. Again, we are prioritizing the relationship that is about connection, not disconnection. Yeah, it's probably that, uh, you know, adults would naturally know how to deal with a toddler, like who can't com communicate that well when they're having a tantrum of just going, well, we love them anyway. You know, yes. we'll connect with them and go, are you, you know, mm. what's going on with you? And then as the, as the years go on, it goes, oh, now you're just being a little dog. Yeah, like now you're just, totally. <laughs> you know, yeah. but it's, it's the same yeah. thing. Like you know how to do it yeah. naturally. Yes. Yeah. With little ones, we, we're very forgiving, aren't we? Because they're little and they're learning and they're cute and all that gorgeous and they still smell good. Right. But then when you've got an eight year old who doesn't smell as good and, uh, you know, you can yes. see that they're bigger and they're more capable of things, but they still have feelings as well. And it is that beautiful balance between, you know, the limits and the guiding and the connection and the love and acceptance, all those kind of things. You know, I think we've swung too far in one direction of being really, you know, authoritarian and punitive and I'm the boss and this is what we do and then we can swing too far in the other direction of being super permissive and just want to keeping our kids happy all the time and there's no limits but mm. really where we need to be is yep. sitting in the middle which is really about a balance of both but mainly and most importantly about the adult us being calm and connected because we set the tone for the relationship yeah i have found with chaplin that he is so aware when me and my wife cara are on the my our phone like where, when we're, we're both on our phone and he's watching the TV, he will sometimes just go, get up and go. Whoa! And it's like, he's like, <laughs> someone pay attention to me. Someone yeah. like connect with yeah. me and he totally. knows it. And so I'm always like, mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it's time. Like if he is, if he's yeah. aware, yeah. like yeah. I'm like, Oh, this is terrible. And uh, you know, but it's weird how he's aware of it. In fact, I've found a lot of parenting advice to be quite counterintuitive just generally like um, when I, I've heard that, you know, I've, I hear, I just hear different things in my head when I'm doing things like when he, sometimes I tell him he's a good boy or like mm. when he obeys me, right. I tell him he's a good boy mm. or I really congratulate mm. him when he climbs a mm. tree or something. And I mm. always get this feeling like the opposite of what I'm doing is the right way. Like I just, I just can't figure it out because I know that there's yeah. this, there's all this modern parenting advice that's, that's yeah. out there that I just don't know yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're the first yeah. person I know who does what you do. And so it's weird. Like, is he, is he a good boy if he obeys me? Can I say that? You know? <laughs> well, I think 
it's, I mean, it's tricky. Language is hard. And I think whether we like it or not, we're so imprinted with how we were raised. And I, I know so many mm. adults I've worked with who are like, I was determined never to be like my mum, you know, and then I have children and all of a sudden my mum's words just come pouring out of my mouth, right? And you're like, ah, yes, I don't want to do that because that's, that's our only model often of what parenting is. I mean, coming back to the good boy thing, right? You know, I, 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 and look, many people have different opinions on this, but I come back to this is that we want your beautiful son to know he is amazing no matter what, even when he's upset or whether he climbs a tree well, right? And so sometimes when we use good boy because they've done what we want, we're sometimes setting up a story that says, when you please me, you're enough. But when you're upset, you're not, you know, so if you wanted to use the word good boy, you could use the good boy when he has a big cry and go, good boy, you let it all out, right? Well mm-hmm. done. But usually yeah. sometimes what we talk about is really about we're just we're observing the effort. That's usually a better way to do it, right? So, you know, it might be that, you know, you ask him to do something and he does it and you go, oh, thanks for doing that for me, mate. You know, and you and you like, oh, yeah. I really loved how you came over when I asked you to do it. Thank you. That was really helpful for me. So we can praise more of the effort. So if he climbs the tree, he can be like, wow, gosh, I, I was so, I loved watching you climb that tree. Not so much about whether he climbed to the highest or the first branch, but where we're watching mm. and observing i see you this is amazing you know but and so i think it's it's you know language is is tricky and sometimes i think parents can get a bit stilted is that the right thing to say or not i'm like don't sense yourself just say what feels natural but really i guess you come back at the end of the day to going i want him to know that he's amazing just the way he is whether he's having some big feelings whether he is drawing a beautiful painting whether he is you know whatever it is that he's got going on that that his spirit and who he is is enough. For yeah. me. He doesn't have to be anything else to get my love. Yeah. Oh, this is a good question. I've always wondered this. Um, at some point in the last, I don't know how many years, like spanking is now inappropriate. And I was mm-hmm. spanked as a kid. And, mm-hmm. you know, my personal opinion of it is, and, uh, you know, like this is just my opinion. I didn't think it did me any harm, but mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not okay anymore. In fact, it's against the law mm-hmm. in New Zealand. Um mm-hmm. When is the time to punish and how is the time? Like, how, so, and then how do you do that? You know? Yeah. Well, this might not be surprising, but I don't actually believe in punishments because, and look, I have oh, cool. three kids. I have a 22, I had to have a 22 year old son and a 19 year old daughter and a 14 year old daughter, and we have never punished them. I've never grounded mm. them. I've never done any of those things because my theory sits with this is that there's always a reason for the behavior. So when a child is acting out, when they're doing something, it's not because they're like, gee, this would be good to do this just to piss my parents off, or this would be great to do it just to, you know, see what the reaction is. There's always a reason, right? And again, it comes back to this theory of when children are, you know, acting out or they're doing something, it's usually because there's a lot of hurt there. It's usually because they feel powerless. It's usually because there's just so much built up aggression perhaps inside that it's coming out in the only way that they know how. So if Mm. we were to punish a child for throwing a chair right through the window then what we're doing saying well that's not acceptable the child knows it's not acceptable right but if we come in heavy with right now i'm going to take your phone away from you or now you don't get to watch tv now you're going to do that then what happens is it actually becomes more about the rupture of the relationship than it does about the reason or the thing that they've actually done and as children and as humans, we are hardwired for attachment as survival, which means that when we are born, we come in with two needs. One, I need food and shelter to survive. And the second is I need to attach to someone to keep me safe. Now we learn as a little Mm -hmm. child from that parent or, or whoever we're being brought up with around what attachment looks like. So if the parent figure says, it's not okay for you to cry, you have to be good all the time, then the child will often conform into that, even though it may go against their instincts because it is about survival. And so they basically deny a lot of who they are in order to survive. And that's where we see good boys and good girls, right? And yeah. so then what happens is then when the child does something that the adult deems to be unacceptable, um, then what happens is the adult will then go, well, we're going to add even more, you know, punishment or shame on top of this because you've done something wrong. And again, it's not even about the reason why the child did what they did. It becomes more about the rupture of the relationship for the child. So for me, right, my kids messed up. They totally did. They went through all this, you know, things that you do. They lied about certain things. They tried different things, all that kind of stuff. And the way my husband and I always approach it is when they messed up, the first thing we did is come back and just say, right, what's going on here? What is the reason mm-hmm. behind 
and why what you're doing. And when you kind of are curious and you and you understand the why, it will often make sense to why they did what they did. Sometimes it's pure boredom. Sometimes it's curiosity. Sometimes it's because they are not getting their needs met. Sometimes it's because they feel powerless. And then we get to actually address the real need of the why behind what they did. Now, it doesn't mean that we then just go, okay, it's fine now. We always then went, okay, so where do we need to repair, right? So if you've damaged someone's property, we need to repair this. What is that going to look like? Or if you said yeah. mean things to your sister, how can you repair that? Because when mm. we add a punishment on top of it, what actually happens is these children then grow up to be teenagers who get very good at lying, right? Because if you know that you're going to get punished for doing something wrong, then what do you do? You get really good at being sneaky. You get really good at hiding what you've done because there's no way you're going to yeah. come clean about stuff because what's going to happen? You're going to get grounded. You're going to get punished. So I think it is a bit of a stretch, I know, for a lot of people around, you know, shifting from this behaviorism paradigm, which is, you know, you, you, um, punish when you do something bad and you're rewarded when you do something good. Now our world still works like that, right? I know it's not this ideal. Let's just do that. and It'll be fine. But again, if you, if you look at anybody's work, someone like Dr. Gabal Mate or, or some really of these incredible people who work around trauma, they will tell you people who are in prisons, people who have addictions, mo for most people, the reason why they got themselves in trouble is because of trauma. And it is because of they were either neglected, they were abused, they were assaulted and the crimes they committed or what they did were often about trying to protect themselves, trying to defend themselves, trying to get their needs met in other ways. And then often these people are deeply damaged and traumatized and act out in ways that are not great. And so we can, and we see this even in our education system, in many systems we've got, you know, children who act out are the ones who need the most compassion and understanding because they're often deeply traumatized, their nervous systems are shot, they're needing extra connection and support because they're just responding often to their environments. So essentially, <clears throat> I, well, <laughs> you don't believe in naughty children. You believe no, in not at all. children who need repairing. Yeah. I believe that kids are in balance and out of balance. And I believe that we're all as humans doing the best job we know how. And again, if you jump to the adult version of this, right, we as adults behave in ways sometimes that are not cool, right? But if we were to dig yeah. a bit deeper as to why we're doing it, most of the time we're doing that because we're scared, because we're trying to protect ourselves, because we've been wounded or we have trauma and we're trying to keep ourselves safe. Everybody's always coming from protection. That's, that's who we are as humans, right? And so for adults as well, you know, we know better. We have a fully functioning prefrontal cortex and, and hopefully 20 or 30 years, 40 years of being on the planet, right? We know what is right and wrong. Our children are still learning, yet we often behave in ways that are not okay, not acceptable. Yet we come down mm -hmm. super hard on our kids because I think the belief system is I have to teach you. I have to teach you to be a good citizen in the world. But the more punishment we pile on kids, the harder we are on them, the more disconnected they become and often the more shame they carry and then they've got to spend most of their time trying to undo that whereas the more connection they have the more uh, love and acceptance that we see the more guidance they have by adults modeling healthy behavior modeling repair modeling making mistakes uh, all those kind of things and that's what they grow up to learn is what a healthy human looks like yeah um <clears throat> So let's just, let's just go over some of that because we've covered a lot in the last, I, I, it, to me, it sounds like a philosophy and it doesn't just sound like how to deal with kids. It sounds like how to deal with anybody. Be curious yeah. of what's going on in their lives. What's behind the behavior. Look into that, particularly be curious of the people around you who you see every day, like your spouse or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, seek to understand first before any type of punishment, in fact, maybe don't even punish because you'll probably find a way to repair what's going on. Okay. Because a child's, when a child does something wrong, it's, it's because there's a wounding there or there's a gap. How do we bridge the gap in their lives to make sure that they feel fulfilled in their lives enough to not go and want to do bad things again, like naughty yeah. things, but there's a wound so to be healed. 
Yeah. So sometimes there's a wound to be healed. Sometimes it's just learning. Sometimes it's powerlessness. So it's, it's, I, mm. I think it always comes back to, and it's different for every child, right? It's not just a textbook. Okay. This is what's going on and how do we deal with it? So let's say, for example, like, you know, I know you're about to have another baby, right? So your beautiful two year old is going to become a big brother. And odds are, mm-hmm. there's going to be a lot of feelings about that, right? Because, you know, it all sounds great in theory, becoming a big brother, but the reality will soon drop in for your little one that there's another person here that's taking a whole lot of attention. Now, what is so understandable in that is that he's going to have some big feelings and that may look like him walking up to the baby and, you know, smacking it on the top of the head or him saying, you know, the baby has to live in the toilet or, you know, just acting out in other ways. All of a sudden he doesn't want to sit in his high chair to eat or, you know, he's going to have feelings around the fact that your family is changing. Now we know that there's so much beauty that comes from having a sibling and it's going to be awesome. But, you know, the invitation is to be so aware of how does this feel for my little two-year-old's world? His whole world is turning upside down. It's the equivalent of you bringing home another woman to your partner and saying, it'll be fabulous. She's great. We're going to have so much fun together. (laughs) Now your your partner's going to be like, uh, no, it's not. And you didn't consult me on this. And I don't believe this is okay. And you're sitting there going, it's wonderful. Look how great it is. Right now. I'm sure she would would have big feelings about that. Oh, it would be great. with it. (laughs) So anyway, what we're looking at. I've always said, I think I could handle multiple wives. Wives, could you? Oh yeah. I couldn't handle multiple. There aren't many men who could do it. I reckon I could, I would, I would thrive with like three of them. Like in in the Mormon world, you know? (gasps) Awesome. Well, that's that. I I hold that as a possibility for you. (laughs) But anyway, let's come back to the kids for a minute. This podcast has taken a different tangent. Um, So coming back to you, your son for a second, right? It's understandable he's going to have big feelings around that. And our job is not Mm. to fix it, but it's just to help him unpack the frustrations around it. It's that he is going to feel frustrated. And what he's probably going to need is to be reassured that your connection is still strong. So he might need just more one-on-one time with you where you get to play and you get to laugh and he feels connected. He might need just some special one-on-one time with your partner. So, you know, because no doubt she'll Mm -hmm. be with the baby and there's going to be a lot of presence and attention there. So so really when we look at him acting out, what we're being curious about is, ah, oh, there's a big change that's happened in my family. It's understandable why he's having a hard time. And so what can we do to meet those needs? Well, we can bring more connection. We can bring more laughter and play. We can hold space for his big feelings because when he gets to offload those feelings, he'll come back into balance. It'll feel better. So there's a work in progress, right? We would never punish him you know, if, if he went up and he, you know, wanted to put a pillow on the baby's face, right, which of course we'd be like, oh, that's not okay, right? We're not, if we went into punishing him, you can't do that, it's not okay. All we're often doing is adding more feelings to his big backpack of feelings, you know, because that would be more about, well, now dad's angry with me and nobody loves me and, you know, why did this baby come along? And, and you know, there can be lots of stories like that, whereas really we want to look mm. at it and go, hey, honey, it is not okay to do that to the baby and I can see that you're really frustrated and I'm here, I'm here to help you and I'm going to help you work through these feelings here. And that's kind of what we're looking at is that, you know, when we can be curious about the behaviour and if we can take you know, the punishment or making them wrong off the table first and then be curious as to the why, then when we Mm -hmm. get to the why, that's what we get to work with. And when that need has been met, then they're less likely to continue to do it. I mean, it's, again, if you reflect back on being a child, and I know that said that you were smacked when you were a kid, but when you were angry or you were upset, like what is it that you really wanted from your parents? Like what is it that you really would have needed when you think back to that? Do you mean after being smacked or when I was doing something well, before, naughty? Well, before, hopefully being when you were doing something naughty. Like, you know, what, what was the reason or what was it that you think that you may have wanted? Do you reckon it was attention? Um, Do you think it was? Attention, connection, or just the joy of curiously, you know, pulling the neighbor's hair. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I mean, sometimes it was thing- just fun. Yeah, well, there's that, right? And then we realize, well, that's not okay, yeah. right? So we, we have to be respectful of other people's bodies. Right. But I guess the whole thing is, you know, I've worked with thousands of adults, right? And when we look at our kind of our own adult wounds that we carry, a lot of it stems back to mm-hmm. where our needs weren't met as a child. And when I ask that question to people like when you were really angry or when you were scared or when you made a mistake or when, you know, your brother, you know, you were so frustrated, you kicked your brother or whatever, what is it that you deeply wanted? And they, everyone will say the same answer. I wanted an adult who was calm to come over and say, I can see you're having a hard time. I'm here to help you. 
and to listen yes. to their feelings and to be seen and that they wanted to know that someone was on their side going, I can see there's a reason why this is going on and I'm here and I'm here to help you with it. And then when we meet that need, it can move whatever the behavior is and then we feel connected and we can, we can move forward. Yeah, and I, I think that brings up something really interesting that I've been thinking about a lot lately is the way in which you can patch up the things that you didn't like about the way you were treated when you were a kid. You get to do it the way that you felt was right with your child. So, for instance, I was like, if I was crying for some for a reason that people thought was stupid, my parents or my family would laugh, and I yeah. hated that. Or if I was upset yeah. about something. I was told, oh, you're tired. And I was like, oh, yes. that's, that's so irritating. Or you're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I'll take hungry because if you're, you're going to feed me, mm. that's fine. But if you, you're telling me yeah. it's time to go to bed because I mm. felt a feeling that you think is illegitimate, yes. then that, I found that mm. so irritating. And I think about that a lot. And I think about that even now when he's two, still not quite at the point where we're quite having to do that. But if he cries, I try not to laugh, even if it was kind of funny the way it happened. Yeah. <laughs> like if he fell yeah. over, I just, I'm, I want him to know like, oh, it's, okay. it's okay, like it's legitimate. Yes. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that you can see that, Luke, because you're right. It, you would have felt really undermined as a kid or you would have been, you know, the frustration and the anger in you would have been like, don't patronize me. Like I have feelings. I'm allowed to have feelings. And, and this particularly for men is it absolutely, I see, you know, I really feel for young boys, particularly in the generations past, the message that you were told was don't be sad. Don't be vulnerable. Don't be weak. You know, don't be dramatic. You know, men particularly were taught to suck it up and to not be mm. over the top. Right. And so then what happens is of course their imprint becomes, it's not okay to feel it's not okay to be sad. It's not okay to express myself. And then that has a whole lot of other issues that turn up in adulthood. And so I love what you're doing, that you have the awareness to go, that didn't feel good for me. I want my son to know he can cry if he needs to. And it's a normal, natural expression that we all have as, as humans, right? So I love that you have mm. the wisdom to actually see that. And I think that is a big part of parenting is, is what I call reparenting, which is where we look at what happened to us as a kid and go, well, how do I heal that within myself? So I don't pass on the same pattern because often that's what we do. We carry on the same patterns onto our children and our children are often like, ah, I don't want this. I don't want this pressure to be the best. I don't want this pressure to have to get the best grades to know that I'm okay, you know? And then, and then we, you know, they push back on it. And then as us adults, we're like, how dare you? And I'm just trying to help you when actually it's really your stuff to deal with. Yeah. That's so I, I do think of the way the what modern parenting, I, you know, I see so much. It's almost like, Hey, let's design your child. You know, let's, uh, yeah. let's make them, let's make them incredible. Like, this is how you, this is how you manipulate them into being like this. And I'm like, hold on yeah. a second. I don't think that's what parent, yeah. uh, being, having children is about is about making them what you want them to be. It's about, it's about no, like letting them be what they're exactly supposed to right. be. That is exactly it. Uh, the ultimate gift I think you can give as a parent is to see the child in front of you and value and acknowledge their unique you know, their uniqueness and the magic of who they are. Because when we try and box our kids into specific ways, they push back, they don't like it, or they, you know, become really repressed. And then that can turn up in things like anxiety and depression, the whole lot of other mental health stuff, because they're feeling the pressure mm. to be a certain way to please you. And, and the risk of that, or yes. what happens when we do that is we actually deny who we really want to be as a human. And then we have this battle that goes on that says, but actually I really want to be a fabulous dancer, but my parents, expects me to be an accountant because that's what we do in our families. And then we have this split because, again, it becomes about attachment. I need my parents' approval to know that I'm loved and I'm okay. And so, therefore, I'll deny or betray myself in order to do that. And that is where I find a lot of adults get to and end up in therapy because they've realized that that's what they've done a lot of their lives. And we don't want to do that to our kids. We want our kids to be free to be the most magnificent, awesome versions of themselves. And in order for us to do that, you know, we need to be connected to them. We need to have those beautiful limits and guidelines, but we also need to make sure that we're not projecting our own crap onto them. So they're free to be who they mm. need to be. I think one of the main takeaways that I'll take away from what you're talking about is the fact that punishment is severance of our relationship. That punishment goes, we're not good anymore. You are not, your love is mm. out, your love from, mm. you know, your love, your love from me comes with conditions. If you're naughty, I'm going to yes. punish you and sever our relationship. And then, yes. and then like 
that, that that's a terrible thing to hold over a little child's head is to go like, totally. if you do, if you're naughty, I'm not going to love you anymore. Yeah, that's it. Well, that that's the bottom line. That's behaviorism. And that is pretty much how mm-hmm. most of us were raised, right? That's how the world has been. And it is shifting slightly, but it's part, that's what our education system looks like. It is all about behaviorism. Be good, sit down, do the work. And then I will give you an A and say that you're a good student, right? But only a small yeah, percentage yeah. of kids learn that well and are good at regurgitating information. You know, children have so many talents and so many ways to learn and it is not seen. And so then they get put in a system where they're like, well, I'm dumb or I'm not as smart as this when actually they're brilliant and they're incredible, but they just learn through moving their body or they learn by using their hands or they learn by speaking Mm. or, and so I think it's a shift for our world in a big way. And for me, it starts with parenting because, and the question I always say to parents is this, is like, think back to when you're a kid. What is it that felt the hardest? What is it that you deeply needed from your parents? And just start there. Start there. That's a good place to start. If you don't know what to do with your five-year-old or your 10-year-old, go back to being five or 10 and think about what is it that I really needed at that time? And most of the time, the answer is this. I needed connection. I needed acceptance. I needed some time and presence with my parent. You know, I needed to feel that who I was was okay. Yeah. So you've written a new book. I think the title sums it up. It's called Raising Resilient and Compassionate Children. Um, Yes. A lot of what we're talking about here, I imagine you go through that in the book. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. It's kind of, the book is about a lot of tools to use. So we talk about the power of play Mm -hmm. to help create connection and healing. We talk about listening to feelings. We talk about a lot of the big stuff that comes up, something that we talk about, which is about, um, you know, suppressing our feelings and how our kids can suppress their feelings and what we can do to work with that. We talk about aggression and anger because that's a huge part of parenting sometimes, navigating that. And we talk a lot about our own patterns and stories around what we bring to parenting and how we can heal some of our own stuff so we don't pass it on to our kids. So it is a, um, a very compassionate guide to understanding parenting is hard, man. It's one of the hardest jobs we ever do, right? And there is no perfect. Mm. We are all doing the best job we know how. And what we need as parents is we need a lot of compassion for ourselves. We need a lot of support and we need to know that we're all doing the best we can. And so the, the more that we can, I guess, get information and understand it and look at our own story, then often the better parent we will be. Beautiful. Lael Stone, tell me how we can keep in contact with you, how we can follow you. Um, Yeah, tell us. Mm, Thank you. Well, um, you know, there's not actually really another Lael Stone in the world, I don't think. So if you Google me, I pretty much turn up at the top, which is handy. That's the only thing that was good about getting a weird name from my parents. Um, But I'm on social (laughs) media at Lael Stone and my website's laelstone.com.au. We have a podcast called the Aware Parenting Podcast where we talk about all these topics. So I think we've got like 120 episodes on there and we talk about everything from like hitting and biting to sleep to all the stuff. So you can find us on there as well. So, um, yeah, all, all all the places on social beautiful we'll link to your instagram that'll be in the show notes and your website and your podcast all in the show notes Mm -hmm. so get to know lael stone lael thanks so much for coming on the zaddy zone Mm -hmm. thank you so much for having me